In the name of the Father, and the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we remember this day in which you guided the Church by the gentle, loving hands of Pope Leo the Great. We ask your guidance upon us still. Give to our current bishops, pope, and priests the same courage that St. Leo exemplified to stand up for the truth of our faith and to protect the Church from all those who would attack her. And we ask this blessing upon us in the name and the words our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And just uh, before I hand the mic back, uh, a brief word of an encouragement and kudos for you all being here. I thought of the image of you know, St. Leo the Great today, that we truly are standing on the shoulders of giants. But if you stand on the shoulder of giants and you don't look around and know what you're about, you end up bumping your head as the giant goes to the door. And so it is very important for us to understand what our church teaches, to see what those truths were that St. Leo the Great worked so hard to make clear for us, to pass on from our Lord Jesus Christ and the Apostles. So most certainly to commend you for uh, being here. And we still have one or two spots, so try next week to uh, grab somebody on your way through and uh, we'll hopefully get them hooked as well. Thank you. I know I went long on that, um, and we have a lot to get through tonight, so we'll welcome. I think, Mark, you're going you're gonna to lead off, so please welcome Mark Winch. So you're back. Yeah, 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 daunting. Yeah, yeah, I'm impressed. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Yeah, again, yeah, I, I, I try to plug the whole wonder theme, you know, uh, because it gets people coming back if they didn't understand anything. You know, I can, I can just blame it on... Now, the, of establishing, uh, of encouraging them the, the, the fundamental pre, primordial philosophical attitude towards reality, wonder. You know, and that's my excuse for not making any sense. You know. <laughs> Anyhow, yeah. <clears throat> now, now, let's, let's uh, I, I wanted to start with a joke, uh, but I have a few jokes kind of, you know, that I'll, I'll kind of wa- you know, interlace the lecture with, you know, keep, keep your, your attention. So let's dive into things, because as you see behind me, we have a lot to cover. Okay, we have a lot to cover. So what I want to do, so let's just kind of uh, contextualize uh, what we're doing here, okay, today with what we did last time, and where we're going next time. So what we're trying to show, uh, at least in the series, uh, uh, Professor McGuire and myself, is how, okay, the ancient and biblical world, okay, how the ancient world, even the pagan world, uh, by what was going on in terms of their rational speculation on the nature of reality. And the history, the contingent history uh, that predated uh, our Lord's birth, how God was using that providentially, okay, and preparing, if you will, uh, uh, the world and even human minds for the coming of Christ and the fullness of truth articulated in his church. So that's what we're doing. Now, last time, what did I do? Last time, what I wanted to show you is the dependence our minds have, okay? Our, our minds that are open to theological truth, the truths of our church, and the dependence we have for our assent to theological truth upon certain philosophical categories. And, and what do I mean by philosophical categories? What I mean is our approach to reality by reason, okay? Now, uh, uh, prescinding, if you will, from our life of faith, how we approach reality, uh, the world in which we live, ourselves, and, and, and what we can know about reality apart from what God has come down and told us. Okay? Now, this is what philosophy is. Okay? Now, if your philosophy is suitable, as I mentioned, the seed of revelation can find a home. Okay, it, it can be sown in fertile soil. However, if your approach to reality is all wrong, okay, it's just put in kind of a colloquial way, then revelation finds infertile soil. It finds a kind of hard-packed soil, and, and there's no room for it to, uh, to, to, to grow and to flourish. 
Now, I mentioned this by way of the biography of Augustine. St. Augustine was a devout materialist. And what does that mean? What is materialism? Let me take, take, take someone, a volunteer. If someone is a materialist, what, what might you say about them? Take a stab at it. They only believe what they can see or, or experience. Yeah, very good. Yeah, that's, that's very well put. Okay. And, and what we can see and experience are things that are sensible. Okay. And not super sensible. Okay. Super sensible, something like God, is beyond our powers to sense. In other words, it reduces all that is to matter. If something exists, if something is, then it's going to be material. Okay? However, St. Augustine, through encountering the plateness, through encountering the works of individuals who are influenced by the last person on this list, Plato, okay? and these dates are before Christ, okay? uh, 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 or else we wouldn't be doing this series, of course. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, uh, you know, if, 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 if he hadn't read okay, works by the Platonists and those who were influenced by Plato, he wouldn't have found an intelligible way to speak about supersensible reality. And what do I mean by that? All I mean is what was, inf- what was implied by the young lady here. Things that exist that aren't material. God, the human soul. And I went into a few arguments last time uh, that I think are ways in which, by, through his encountering of the Neoplatonic works, he was able to justify the existence of the human soul, which is immaterial, and an immaterial God. The immaterial God who is the foundation and the origin of the immaterial eternal truths that we know. The changeless truths that don't depend on anything in the changing world. Like the truths of mathematics even. You know, that, that transcend culture. And we all are going to die. And 2 plus 2 is still going to equal 4. It's immutable and unchanging. And he came to see, by way of how the Neoplatonists approach these questions, how these truths have a foundation not in what is changing or particular, corporeal, things that are going to expire and perish, but in what does not expire and perish, the eternal God. Okay? And this paved the way. And once he overcame his materialism, all of a sudden he was disposed to see the intelligibility of the gospel. And immediately, you know, the, the, the preaching of, son, of, of uh, uh, good son Anselmo, uh, St. Anselm moved him. Anselm, no, no, Ambrose, sorry. Uh, I, I, I just was teaching medieval philosophy when we talking about Anselm, sorry. And, uh, and it was St. Ambrose moved him, and he was shortly thereafter baptized. Okay? And so what, what I'm trying to articulate here is how philosophy can pave the way. Uh, for the seed of revelation to be sown. And that's what we're going to see in the course of this history of Greek thought, which I'm going to go through very rapidly, but not quickly in terms of my speaking. Okay? I, I want to be intelligible. I'll try to keep, keep it slow. But I'm not going to uh, talk as much as I would like about all these individuals. Okay. Now, you'll see a certain progression, a certain kind of, uh, in some way, an advent, this, this preparing okay, of Greek philosophy uh, for, for, the, for uh, ultimately a culmination of Greek thought in the, the kind of the height of the ancient uh, world in terms of its speculative thought, and that would be in the, in the works of Plato and Aristotle. But we see in a lot of these thinkers uh, notions that are very compatible with our scriptures, and these notions influence the Greek mind. And so then when, when uh, the gospel spread uh, through the Hellenistic world and, and the world that's been influenced by the Greeks, People were open. People were disposed to accept the truth of Christ. So let's take it back from the beginning. So from the top, okay, in 585 B.C., we have some of the first philosophers okay, uh, speculating on the nature of reality. Now, what makes philosophy philosophy? Okay? Well, what makes it different is they're looking for natural explanations for what's going on. Things are happening in the world, and philosophers want to know why. Well, everybody does, okay? However, they do by reason, okay? And, and here we find, in, in the naturals, individuals who are trying to find the explanation for where things came from, okay? And, and why things are the way they are. And they weren't referring to mythology. They weren't using the authority of, of, of the muses, the authority of, of the pagan gods, to explain why reality is the way it is, 
but they were trying to offer rational uh, arguments okay, uh, and, and explanations for why things are the way they are. And, and so in, with Thales, and, and you don't have to remember all these names, uh, but he was known to be the first uh, philosopher because he predicted a solar eclipse. Okay? And with this event, people said, hey, wow, I mean, maybe by way of our, 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 our looking at the heavens, looking at the stars, we can discover what makes them tick, you know, well, why things are the way they are. And maybe the gods, you know, the explanation of the pagan gods, our, our gods here, don't explain everything quite as well as reason does. Okay, and it's very interesting. And, and especially when they saw the incongruity or the contradictions that existed within pagan mythology. We find these anthropomorphic gods who we're supposed to call divine, who behave like children, you know, and some of them are, are immoral. They're doing things that you wouldn't want your kids doing. You know, and, and, and how are we worshiping them? And so, so a lot of these thinkers were pointing out some of the contradictions here and not basing their arguments for why things are the way they are simply in the authority of Greek mythology. And this ultimately is the beginning then of, of philosophy, okay, in Ionia, in Asia Minor. Now, these thinkers have something in common. Okay, and I'm going to go through this rather quickly. They try to find an origin for the things we see in some singular principle. Now, what is a principle? A principle is that from which something proceeds. Okay? The principle of, of, of this line you know, that I make on the board okay, is a point. Okay, so that from which something proceeds. Even a conclusion proceeds from premises. Uh, the, dot, uh, the line proceeds from the dot. A cause, okay, is, 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 is a kind of principle of, of, what, of effects, okay? Now, they were looking for a singular explanation. Not exactly a one God, but one explanation for the many things they see, okay? And they all thought it was something material. It was something material from which everything came. Thales held that it was water. Okay? That ultimately, and I'm not going to get into all the details, but he held that it was water. Okay? His, his pupil, Anaximander, thought that water was something too concrete to be the explanation for everything that is. And so he held that it was this boundless something okay? uh, called eperon, okay? that, that, that is the origin of what is. And then uh, his pupil, uh, Anaximenes, thought no. It, that's too boundless. It needs to be something a little more concrete. And so he held that it was air that is the origin and ultimately the source from which everything proceeds. And in addition to this, he gave an explanation. He gave a process by what he called condensation and rarefaction. Okay? Air, in some ways, and I, I can't get into all the details here, helps things come together and brings them apart. And this explains why there are multiple things. And anyhow, you get the idea. Now, it's an insufficient explanation. It doesn't totally work. There's gaps in, in their reasoning. But they're trying, and they're on to something. Now, they're not doing what Plato is going to do and finding a super sensible explanation for what is sensible. But, but they're finding a reason for what is, a cause of all that is. Okay? And they're moving in the right direction. Okay? Now... Uh, and they would argue, however, that everything is eternal. They would say, from nothing, nothing comes. I mean, isn't that true? If we have nothing, what can come out of nothing? Nothing. And so the world was eternal. And they held that matter is eternal, and it always came from this one source. And this is what they had to say. Now, uh, philosophers have always been accused of being slightly impractical. Okay? Now, this is a great quote from Plato, and Aristotle about this character Thales. I think you'll enjoy it. Once while Thales was gazing upwards while doing astronomy, he fell into a well. Okay. <laughs> a clever and delightful Thracian serving girl is said to have made fun of him. You know, just what the guy wanted. You know, after he's in, I'm, it's not bad enough I'm in a well, but this little, ah, this little girl's mocking you. you know? And then, and, 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 and so what happened next? Okay, yeah, he's making fun, she's making fun of him. And since he, was eager to, uh, since he was eager to know the things of heaven, but failed to notice what was in front of him and right next to his feet. Okay? Well, he gets his revenge, you'll see. The story goes uh, on. Okay? The story goes, and this is from Aristotle, uh, talking about Thales. 
that when they found fault with him for his poverty, okay, supposing that philosophy is useless. Have you heard this before? He, I know I have. Anyway, uh, he learned from his astronomy that there would be a large crop of olives. Then, while it was still winter, he attained a little money and made deposits on all of the olive presses in Miletus. Since no one uh, bid against him, he rented them cheaply. When the right time came, suddenly many tried to get the presses all at once, and he rented them out on whatever terms he wished, and so made a great deal of money. In this way, he proved that philosophers can easily be wealthy if they desire, but this is not what they're interested in. Uh, brilliant. That's from Aristotle's Politics. Okay. Now, now, we have them. They're getting the ball rolling. Now, let's move on. I'm going to go through these relatively quickly. The Pythagoreans are interesting. Uh, uh, they're not on Asia Minor now. A lot of the, the, the centers of, of Pythagorean thought are, are in Italy, contemporary Italy, the southern portion, Sicily, and, and, and some of, of the Greek islands. And here we have thinkers who are proposing for the first time the existence of a soul in man that is immaterial. And they talk extensively about immaterial reality, in particular numbers. They're some of the first mathematicians. You've heard of the, you know, Pythagoras in your math classes, studying geometry. I'm sure you've heard of him. But they were also philosophers, okay? And they articulated even that, that numbers were behind all of reality, okay? And that behind, ultimately, even the cosmos is a kind of Harm, harmonious uh, relationship that is related even to number. Very fascinating. Now, moving on, Xenophanes okay, held this. Does this sound a little Christian? That there is a single, non-anthropomorphic God who is unmoving, but all-seeing, all-hearing, all-thinking, and who shakes all things by the thought of his mind. Okay, it sounds a little bit uh, familiar to some extent. Now, now, he articulated as well, criticizing the Greek gods. Uh, and this is something I, I, I referred to earlier. Homer and, Homer and Hesiod have described to the gods, uh, ascribed to the gods all deeds which among men are a reproach and a disgrace, thieving, adultery, and deceiving one another. And this is the way he kind of uh, lampooned, if you will, the pagan gods and favored a kind of single god, that is all-knowing, omniscient, omniscient okay, and, and who moves everything. Now, other thinkers, and, uh, and Exagoras, someone who's not on here, called this divine mind nous, uh, and, and said that, that nous moves everything, and everything is, comes to be through his work. And Empedocles uh, also said something that was very similar. Now, let's move forward to Heraclitus. He even comes up with a notion of logos, okay? And this is a divine law of the universe which rules and guides the cosmos. Okay, it sounds very similar. Now, what's in common with all of these thinkers is that they said everything is change and everything is always changing. And with, except for the, the Pythagoreans, we have no concept of changeless reality. So at least it's not clearly articulated. Now, we have that a little bit in Parmenides. And try to follow his reasoning. And believe me, I'm going to get to Plato, uh, although very shortly. Okay? Very good. Now, Parmenides said this. Okay? And try to follow his argument. Whereas these thinkers before him said, all is change. All is change. He said, nothing is change, and change is an illusion. And this is his argument. If being... That which is, okay, okay, what is, things that exist, you see around you, yourself, desks, chairs, okay, being, what is, if it already is, it cannot come to be. But, if it was not, it could never come to be. Therefore, it always is, and there's no such thing as change. That's his argument, okay? And so we're left with this dichotomy between a changeless uh, people affirming that reality is changing, something we see all the time, and that there's a changeless or immutable nature of reality. 
and there's this great dispute. Now, this leads some people to despair and, and to think that philosophy can give us an answer to these deeper questions. And so we have the sophistic tradition. I'm skipping Democritus. And they will hold, since there's no answers, you might as well just seek power. Okay? And they're the ones that started getting paid for doing philosophy. Okay? And, they, and they, they, they try to get paid for what they're doing. They're interested in political and moral ma matters. And they said things like, man is the measure of all things. Does that sound familiar? They're, they're relatives. And they were trained in making the weak argument look the stronger. Sounds a little bit like they're a bunch of lawyers, you know? Anyhow, we get the, the weak argument look the stronger, okay? And these were uh, the, 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 the philosophers of the time. Now, finally, it takes an individual to stir all this up, and that's Socrates. Okay? Socrates comes on the scene. At first, he looks like a sophist, because he's walking around and talking to people, asking questions, and he's even accused of being a sophist. Now, what he was actually about, and I have to really consolidate this, okay, is what he would do is simply not provide answers, but he would ask questions. And he'd point out to everyone that there conceptions of reality were all contradictory. And he tried to find wisdom and discovered it was not to be found, except in one individual, okay? In the individual who knows he does not know. And so if in this sense alone, Socrates is wise, is that he knows his own ignorance. And that made him wise. In addition, he was a great man of moral integrity. And see if his life matches up at all with the person of Christ. He didn't take any money for what he did. He never wrote anything down. Okay, we know about Socrates because Plato wrote everything down about that Socrates did. He was accused unjustly, okay, uh, and so for, uh, for uh, corrupting the youth ultimately by people who were jealous of the influence he was having on the youth. Even the guards at his death, okay, the guards at his death were moved by his, 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 his moral integrity. Uh, and, and I wish I, I could show you all. I, I was going to read a passage that's really funny, but we're running. Read it? Okay. This is a good one. Oh, this is a good one. This is just kind of fun. So this is the, his life at his death. So at his death, this is from his, uh, the Plato's Phaedo. Uh, and this is a great uh, little uh, part that I, I just kind of like that you might enjoy. And, and uh, what happens is he's accused wrongly. And finally, it's time for him to die. And his, his, his disciples, his, his, his wife comes in. He sends her away with the kids. And, and his wife and his, his friends are there. But they're a mess, okay? And he's the one who's consoling them because he believes his soul is going to live on after death, okay? And so here's the scene, okay? He's, he's just, uh, he drank the hemlock, okay? And it's slowly working on him, okay? And, and so it's, uh, he's, this is what the Phaedo says. He was holding the cup and drained it common easily. Okay, this is an interesting discussion, but we're not going to get into this anyway. Most of us had been able to hold back our tears reasonably well up until then. But when we saw him drinking it, and after he drank it, we could hold them back no longer. My own tears came in floods against my will, so I covered my face. I was weeping for, him, for myself, not for him, for my misfortune in being deprived of a comrade. Even before me, Crito was unable to restrain his tears and got up. Apollodorus had not ceased from weeping before, and at this moment his noisy tears and anger made everybody present break down, except Socrates who said the following, What is this? He said, You strange fellows. It is mainly for this reason that I sent the women away. <laughs> yeah. yeah, To avoid such unseemliness. For I, for I told you, one should die in good omened silence. So keep quiet and control yourselves. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's good Socrates. Yeah, 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 his last moments. Okay, now the last thing I'll say. I want to tie this in. Now Plato comes around. And Plato is dealing with this problem. How to reconcile Parmenides' argument that rejects change with the fact that things are changing and we want to affirm that the world is changing around us. Well, what does he do? He holds that this world is changing. But this world isn't all that exists. There is a world of forms, an immutable realm above and beyond our world that is changeless. This is where the immaterial soul is from, before it descends into the body. Okay? And, and knowledge is remembering when we know eternal truths. 
the truths of mathematics. What are we doing? We're remembering what we once knew when we could see these forms directly. And these are the patterns, the blueprints after which the demiurge, which is a kind of God figure, creates the world. Okay, the, the St. Peter's Basilica is beautiful, but it's not beauty itself. Beauty itself is an immutable form. And after the pattern of this, this demiurge fashioned particular things. And all of a sudden, we have an immaterial realm, which is the grounding of, of truth. And here, this tradition goes on to influence individuals like St. Augustine in countless ways. I wish I could get into all of them, but I can't. And even these immaterial forms. What does Christianity do? They put them in the mind of God. And God, reflecting upon the many ways his own being can be reflected outside of himself, chooses on these patterns to create the world. And that world, however, has an origin in the supersensible, immutable realm, the world of forms for Plato, but the Christian God for our faith. Okay? And this is one of the ways here, okay, I'm out of time, that, uh, that, that the Platonic tradition here, is going to pave the way for Christianity. And hopefully that ties in a little bit uh, what was going on last week uh, with, with a little bit of this history. Now next time, we're going to get into the discussion of Aristotle. I'm going to say a few more things about Plato, and then we're going to discuss Aristotle. Because these two thinkers, more than any others uh, in the history of ideas, are going to influence profoundly the way we talk about our faith, the way we express it, and uh, the way we come to truth. Okay, so thank you for your attention. God bless, and uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you, Mark. Oh, boy. Now we have to clean all this philosophy off the board really quickly. Give ourselves a tabula rasa here. Sort of like what television does for you. <laughs> All right. So uh, thanks to my, to my colleague for that great lecture on the, the philosophy of the Greeks. Now, it's interesting for us to note, geographically, in the Greek world, right, we can line up the philosophy of the pre-Socratics and of Socrates and Plato with Athens. Right? We can line it all up with Athens. Right? Now, did all of these men live in Athens? No. Of all the men that, that my colleague was just discussing, the pre-Socratics, of course, none of them lived in Athens. Right? The majority of them lived in Asia Minor. Right? But here's how, ultimately, Athens comes to be the repository of Greek thought. Right? Here's how. Right? All of the pre-Socratics that my colleague just mentioned. When I say pre-Socratics, I mean everyone that he mentioned before he mentioned Socrates. Right? <laughs> Got that? <clears throat> okay. All of those guys. Uh, the, the vast majority of them came from the Greek city-states of Asia Minor. Right? Now, when I say Asia Minor, geographically, everyone knows what I'm talking about. Right? We're talking about the eastern coast of the Aegean Sea. We're talking about modern-day Turkey. Right? This was part of the Greek world in ancient times. In, in the 6th and 5th centuries before Christ, this was a, as much a part of the Greek world as Greece was itself. Right? And so these men, these Greek philosophers, men like Thales, men like Anaximander, Anaximenes, Anaxagoras, all of these early thinkers, Empedocles, Parmenides, these men lived in the world of Greek Asia Minor. Right? Now the city-states of Asia Minor, the vast majority of them, belonged right, <clears throat> to the, the subset of Greeks that we can call Ionians. Right? Ionians are a subset of Greeks that are, uh, you, you can kind of divide ancient Greeks by, by dialect, by linguistic dialect. The Ionians were one main group. Right? The, the Dorians were another, another principal group of Greeks. Right? Now what we see is that the majority of these pre-Socratics who are operative in the 6th century before Christ and in, in the first half of the 5th century before Christ, <clears throat> they all are Ionians. Right? And so as a result, their thought is most easily and readily communicated throughout the Ionian world. In fact, it's, it's no accident for a variety of reasons that the, the Ionians are 
uh, most prominent as philosophers, while the, the Dorians are, are mostly interested in other things, military pursuits, uh, to a certain extent in poetry and music, but not as much in philosophy. Right? As a result, by the time we get to, to the middle of the 5th century BC, uh, all of this great Ionian philosophy that's been achieved by the pre-Socratics, and, and then to a certain extent by Socrates and, and Plato, all of it comes to be kind of deposited at Athens, because Athens, by the middle of the 5th century, is the preeminent Ionian city-state in the Greek world. In fact, by the middle of the 5th century, Athens has risen to a position of military and political dominance over all the Ionian city-states in the Aegean world. Now, we talked a little bit about this last time, if you guys remember from last week. Why is, how does Athens become the most prominent city-state in the Ionian world? How is that? Right, right. They, they took the lead in forming a coalition right, to aggressively take the war to the Persians. After 479 BC, when the Persian threat to Greece uh, had been repulsed, when the Persians had been driven in disgrace from the shores of Europe back to Asia whence they came, it was the Athenians who took the lead in uh, going on the offensive against the Persians. The Athenians, in fact, formed a league of Ionian city-states which they called the Delian League. Now, it's interesting. Uh, the Delian League was nominally a, uh, a voluntary alliance of city-states, right, for purposes of, of mutual defense against Persia. Right? And yet, as time goes on, right, after 479, particularly in these years between 479 and 449, as the struggle against Persia is continued, right, the Delian League begins to look less and less like a voluntary alliance of city-states and more and more like an Athenian empire. Right? Now, there are certain uh, particular things that, <laughs> that really mark the transition from a voluntary alliance to an Athenian empire, one of which is the, the uh, translation, uh, miraculous translation of the, the treasury uh, <laughs> from Delos to Athens, right? and uh, then the... <laughs> the use of all the money in the treasury to build these great buildings that are still there if you go to Athens today, right? all the great architectural works of the Acropolis, many of the great works of art that we associate with ancient Athens. Uh, these things were uh, only made possible by the fact that all the other poor city-states were paying dues to the Delian League. Right? Uh, but be that as it may, Athens, by means of the Delian League, becomes the most prominent and powerful Ionian city-state in the Greek world by the middle of the 15th century, and therefore the repository of Ionian culture, the heir of Greek philosophy, uh, and you know, the, the city-state that was responsible most for fostering the achievements that we associate with Greek culture, the great achievements not only in philosophy, but also in the, in the fields of literature and poetry and architecture and the visual arts, uh, and even in government and politics to a certain extent. Right? And so on the one hand, if, if we can see the, the ancient Greek world in the 5th century as, as characterized by a dichotomy between Ionians and Dorians, right? between the Delian League, the Ionian city-states, led by Athens on the one hand, right? and existing in a dichotomy right? with the Dorian city-states, who are led by Sparta. Right? Now, Sparta and Athens were as different as two city-states could possibly be. Not only is one Ionian and the other Dorian, right? that's a mere dialectical difference, a very ephemeral difference, not, not necessarily something that indicates uh, deeper disagreements. And yet there were deeper disagreements, weren't there? Athens was democratic. Sparta was a great oligarchy. Right? It may surprise us to note that Athenian democracy, despite being uh, something that modern people look back on fondly, Athenian democracy was actually not very well regarded in the ancient world by enlightened men. Educated men tended to look at, at the Spartan regime as more ideal. Why? Because it lent itself to military dominance and state security in a way that Athenian democracy did not. Right? But be that as it may, it's as though by necessity these two city-states are propelled into a rivalry with one another in the middle of the 5th century. Athenian dominance via the Delian League, Athenian dominance in the Greek world is something that Sparta feels very much threatened by. Right? And after a series of conflicts and disputes, finally, in the year 431, the Spartans had had enough and declared war on Athens. Right? This led to a conflict that we know as the Peloponnesian War. The Peloponnesian War, to, to a certain extent, 
it defines the Greek golden age. Right. This is a war that takes place right at the time when some of the greatest works of, of Greek philosophy and literature are being composed. Right? When Socrates was active, uh, when the Parthenon was being built, the Peloponnesian War marks this period. Right? Yet we know the outcome of this war between Athens and Sparta. The, the war between Athens and Sparta ultimately results in what? A Spartan victory or an Athenian victory? What is it? It's a Spartan victory at the end of the day, isn't it? Right? It is a Spartan victory, and uh, I'd, I'd like to get into all the details and, and all the twists and turns of the war, but we don't have time. And to a certain extent, they're, they're not relevant to, to the essence of what we're getting at tonight. So I'll simply ask you, how is it that Athens loses this war? You may be surprised by the answer, because I, I will tell you, Athens loses this war because Athens was a democracy. Now, this is something that the ancients very much believed. Socrates and Plato very much believed this, right? Aristotle certainly believed this. The ancient philosophers in general held. Athens lost this war because it was a democracy, whereas the Spartan form of government was vindicated, as it were, by its victory in this war. Now, I, I can get into particulars here. What do I mean when I say Athens loses this war because, of, because it was a democracy? What do the philosophers say is the worst thing about democracy? Philosophical relativism? Nope. Not philosophical relativism. Yeah, it has to do with practical decision making in a way that uh, the ancients held. It, it just lends itself towards lack of security for your city state because the popular will can be easily swayed. Whereas an enlightened king, an enlightened philosopher can see what's best for a city state, the popular will doesn't always necessarily see what's best for a city state. Right? And so what happens here, in, in very particular terms, you know, but towards the end of the war, around 406, 406 or so, it looked like Athens was going to win. Right? Athens was on the ascendancy here. They had won a series of dramatic naval victories over the inferior navy of Sparta. Right? And yet in 406, after one of these great victories, the Battle of Arganusae, in 406, uh, the Athenian admirals, after demolishing a Spartan fleet, the Spartan fleet commanded by Callicratidas, the admiral. Uh, they, they destroyed you know, 70 or 80 Spartan ships. Uh, it was a, a dramatic victory for Athens. Right? After this battle, what happens? What happens? Due to the, the approach of an imminent storm on the sea, right, the Athenian admirals have to make a heart-rending decision. Right? Think of it this way. Uh, one of your top priorities after a naval battle, particularly a naval battle that you won in the ancient world, one of your top priorities is to then go around in your triremes and pick up survivors. Right? You, you have to pick up, because there's going to be a ton of survivors floating on the water. You particularly want to pick up your own survivors, right? Uh, and yet, due to an imminent storm, the Athenian naval commanders make a decision that that's just not possible. Right? We have to get the fleet back into port immediately or else the entire fleet will be destroyed. So in the interest of saving the whole fleet, right, the Athenian admirals make an executive decision. They bring the fleet back into port without taking time to pick up survivors. Now, this doesn't go over too well among the democratic sailors who populate uh, the, the ore banks of the triremes. Right? These guys are not too happy to see their comrades left behind. And so what do they do? They bring a charge against the admirals in the Athenian popular assembly. Right? They charge the admirals with gross negligence and uh, disregard for the lives of their comrades. And of course, in the fervor of popular opinion that results, just this, this tremendous upsurge of, of popular outrage against the admirals for their conduct here, a death sentence is passed, and all the competent naval commanders in Athens are executed. Great job, democracy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, now, it's kind of interesting because you know, you know the Athenians chose the majority of their leaders by lot, right? Military commanders were the one thing that they didn't choose by lot, with good reason, right? And uh, so after 406, they have to resort to far inferior commanders. Now, uh, as a result of this, this terrible verdict in the aftermath of Arganusae, uh, the Spartan fleet was able to regain uh, some freedom of action on the Aegean. In fact, the Spartan fleet actually sailed up to the northern mouth of the Aegean Sea, right, where you can cross from the Aegean Sea into the Black Sea, 
Right? Now, there, there are two narrow straits that you have to pass through to get from the Aegean to the Black Sea. Do you guys know what they are? Yeah, you have the, the Bosporus, and then you have the, the Dardanellus, which in the ancient world they called it the, the Hellespont. Right? Uh, and so what, what the Spartan plan was, was to sail up around the Hellespont and block off the Hellespont. They had a reason for doing this. Right? Athens subsisted during the Peloponnesian War only because it had far-flung overseas colonies that provided it with grain. Right? The, and the, the most uh, kind of prolific grain-providing colonies that the Athenians had were in the Ukraine, in the Crimea, actually, right? far, far away. So these ships would come, they would cross the Black Sea right? and then sail through the Bosporus, across the Sea of Marmara, through the, the Hellespont, down into the Aegean and over to Attica. Right? Now, if you can block up the Hellespont, you can starve Athens. Right? So the Spartan fleet was hanging around, up around the Hellespont, messing with Athenian shipping. Right? The Athenians, to stop them, sent what? A fleet under the command of a pack of fools. <laughs> Incompetent, inexperienced naval commanders were sent up to, to try to deal with the Spartan threat. Uh, so to, to make a long story short, the Athenian commanders sailed their fleet up near the mouth of the Hellespont. Right? And then they decided, you know, in the ancient world, you can't stay at sea for many weeks at a time for a variety of reasons. Uh, number one, you have to let the rowers rest their legs and stretch their legs. Uh, number two, you don't have, I mean, these ships are relatively small. You don't have giant casks of fresh water and things on, on board ship, right? So you have to let the guys off the ships every now and then, right? So the Athenians thought it would be a good idea to go up around the mouth of the Hellespont and uh, kind of run their ships up on the beach to let the guys out. Now, when they did this, uh, it, it's kind of ironic. There was a retired Athenian admiral whose name was Alcibiades. Right? Uh, he had a, a guy with a very checkered past. Retired Athenian admiral. There are reasons why he's retired. But uh, he was living in retirement up in a castle up by, by the mouth of the Hellespont. When he, when he saw the Athenians beaching their ships, he came running down from his castle in a frenzy and said, no, you guys are crazy. Here, let me tell you what to do. And they wouldn't listen to him. Right? And then finally, the next day, the Spartans pulled up in their fleet. The, the Athenian ships were completely vulnerable there on the beach, and the Spartans simply came and torched the Athenian fleet. Right. Now, that was the end of Athens in the Peloponnesian War. They could no longer defend their supply routes. They could no longer keep the city supplied with grain. And so in 404, after a crippling period of starvation, the city of Athens was forced to surrender. Now, here's where things get interesting. You know, it was customary in the Greek world to treat your defeated opponent in a certain way. Do you know what that was? Uh, yeah, either, either burn their city and massacre them, uh, or burn their city, massacre some of them, and enslave the rest. Right? Yeah, so you have option A and option B. Right? Now, it's, it's very interesting, though. Imagine if the Spartans had conducted themselves this way towards Athens in 404. What would become of Greek thought? What would have become of Greek philosophy right, if Athens had been destroyed in 404? Certainly what we know of Greek thought would never have survived. And not only Greek thought, but, but I, I insist on including Greek tragedy as well. Even the works of Homer, which were codified and kept at Athens, right? All of these things would undoubtedly have been lost to history. So much of ancient literature and thought is lost to history anyway. Can you imagine what would have happened if Athens had been destroyed? Right? And yet the Spartans, almost inexplicably, do not destroy Athens in 404. And they give a reason. And the reason is in commemoration of the role that Athens had played in the war against Persia. Right. In thanksgiving for the role of the Athenians at the Battle of Marathon earlier in the century. And so in commemoration of their period as allies against the Persians, Athens was spared. And so we see providentially, step by step, right, first of all, the defense of the Greek world against the Persians. Right? Second of all, the Peloponnesian War, which results in the defeat of Athens, but not its destruction. Right? But the Peloponnesian War paves the way for other things, does it not? The Peloponnesian War paves the way for the subjugation of all of Greece, 
Right. Now, here's why. You can imagine this long war, 431 to 404, weakens Athens and Sparta tremendously. It weakens both of them. Even though uh, uh, Sparta comes out on top, at the end of the day, it's still going to be a Pyrrhic victory for the Spartans. Right? And so the two preeminent Greek city-states uh, of mainland Greece are both going to be tremendously weakened by all of this. Now what you're left with is a Greek peninsula that's going to have a harder time defending itself against outside forces. Right? And the chief outside force that emerges and threatens Greek independence in the following century is Macedon. Right. Now, we know that the, the great king of Macedon who first subjugated Greece was a man by the name of Philip, Philip II of Macedon. But Philip II of Macedon died in 336. Right? He died in 336 under very strange circumstances. He was assassinated by one of his bodyguards at a family wedding. Right? Very, very strange circumstances. Uh, Philip of Macedon had a, a long and painful history of, of attending family weddings and getting drunk and doing funny things. Uh, in fact, <laughs> uh, Philip of Macedon, had, he, he had these great plans that after he finished conquering Greece, he was going to go conquer all of Asia. Right? Uh, and then there was one family wedding. It was actually the wedding of his son, Alexander. Uh, Philip, uh, supposedly, he got into some kind of a scuffle, uh, and he, he got up to draw his sword and, and go attack the other guy, and he kind of stumbled and fell flat on the floor, and uh, his son just pointed at him and said, there you go, everybody, there's the guy who's going to conquer Asia. Let's, let's hear it for the guy who's going to conquer Asia, right? Uh, so, of course, Philip of Macedon doesn't conquer Asia, right? He had, uh, yeah, too many weird things he was involved in. He ends up being assassinated under very strange circumstances in 336, uh, but... What this does is it paves the way for the rise of Philip's son, whose name is Alexander, known to us as Alexander the Great. All right. Now, Alexander the Great was the first man to, to kind of realize the full potential right, that's posed by the, the superiority of Greek arms over the rest of the world. Right? Alexander the Great of Macedon realized, heck, look, Greek modes of fighting are so far superior to those utilized by the Persians, for example, there's no reason why we can't conquer the whole of the Persian Empire. All we need is the will to do it. Right? And Alexander certainly had the will to do it. Right? And between 336 and 328, Alexander did it. Right? Now keep in mind, in 336, when he takes over the kingdom of Macedon and the rule over Greece, Alexander is, what, 20, 21 years old. In that short of a time, between 336 and 328 BC, he conquered all of Asia Minor, all of Syria, Palestine, Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Iranian Plateau, right? and further east, even into the Swat Valley in Pakistan. Right? He created one of the largest empires that the world had ever seen in that short a period of time, just an eight-year period, from his early 20s to his late 20s. He was kind of busy. Right? Um, now, there's a, a funny story about Alexander, right? Um, when Alexander was in the process of conquering Persia, all right, the, the death of his rival, Darius III, moved him very greatly. Darius III, the, the last great king of, of the Persians, uh, he met Alexander in battle several times. And every single time Darius met Alexander in battle, uh, his, his Persian armies, although vastly superior numerically, were routed in the field of battle. Now, the final story of, of Darius' death was indeed very moving, and it was moving to Alexander. Darius was um, at the field of battle in, um, uh, near, near Babylon in Mesopotamia, in, uh, at Guagamela, Guagamela in Mesopotamia. Um, Darius uh, had an army that was two to three times the size of Alexander's, right? And they met in battle. There was great confusion among the Persian forces. It turned into a rout. Darius himself fled from the field of battle. After he fled the field of battle, Darius III was assassinated by one of his own bodyguards, right, in utter shame right, at having fled from, from the battle. And so the Macedonian troops actually found Darius III covered in stab wounds, but still breathing. And the last great king of the Persians breathed his last in the arms of his Macedonian captors. He held the hands of one of the Macedonian soldiers, and he said, I thank God that I am not dying alone. Thank you for being with me. I didn't want to die alone. Right. Alexander then buried Darius III with all the honors, civic and religious, traditionally accorded to the Persian emperors, 
and he named himself as Darius' heir. Right. So Alexander's idea is a genuine fusion of Eastern and Hellenic culture, what we call Hellenistic culture. Right. And so what we're going to see is that Alexander's chief accomplishment is not political. Indeed, Alexander's great empire uh, didn't really survive his death. Alexander dies in 323, and uh, right away his empire disintegrates politically. No, Alexander's achievement was not political. It was, in fact, cultural, because what he did was he brought Greek philosophy, Greek literature, uh, just as a common idiom of thought, Greek culture, to the Eastern world, to the Persians and to the Jews and to the Egyptians, to all the peoples of the East. Right? And this paves the way for the spread of the gospel. Now I'm out of time, so there we have it. Thank you guys for covering so much material in such a short amount of time. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a five-minute break, and we'll come back together for five minutes of Q&A. Okay, God bless you. Thank you for coming tonight. Our usual rules apply. We're going to go maximum of five minutes um, and uh, maximum of five questions, whatever we get to first. And uh, make sure your, your question is one sentence long, and make sure that it has a question mark on the end. Okay, so we do, the, come on guys, we do the best Q&A anywhere, right? Yeah. Our Q&A is usually deadly. Yeah, but not at the Institute of Catholic Culture. Okay, here we go. I was just curious what the very early philosophers, what kind of um, hardships they went when they were trying to change the thought with the, with the Greeks, what, what happened with them and what was their life like? My, my, my colleagues said they, said they just they made a lot of money off olives, so that kind of that kind of um, you know to help help to help take them take the blows there. You know, it, it really it depends. I mean, to very very and lesser degrees, there is persecution. Xenophanes, an individual I refer to here, uh, was was you know, severely persecuted and uh, and you know and tried and, and imprisoned. Uh, we have Socrates, you know, was executed. So to varying extents, they're all persecuted. The Pythagoreans have their own community. It was a community of, of education, a, a religious community. And, and because partly due to their persecution in other places of Greece, they ended up settling in, in modern-day Sicily and, and southern Italy. And, and so they actually isolated themselves uh, due to kinds of persecution. So to varying degrees, they were all persecuted. Especially, I mean, you can, you, there was obviously the charge of impiety that could be brought against them. Uh, even uh, Anaxagoras, you know, who held that the, the, the sun was not a god, but, but a rock in the sky, you know, didn't go over so well. And in fact, they, they accused Socrates of the exact same thing. And, and Socrates said, yeah, I, I, he actually said, I, I don't care. I have no idea what that thing is, you know. Uh, but, but, you know, uh, you know, but, but, you know, I... And so, so he just kind of distanced himself from the naturals, and, and he held that all he was doing was asking questions. Although every now and then, even though he asked a bunch of questions, it seemed like he knew a few answers as well. So I, I don't know. He, 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 his, his learned ignorance, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, didn't prohibit him from knowing something as well. Anyhow, so, so to varying degrees, uh, they were persecuted. Some of them severely uh, and the rest, some of the others uh, s sought isolation in order to flee persecution. What were some of the military advancements of the Greeks? The, the question is, what were some of the military advancements of the Greeks? Uh, well, there, there are a couple things that make Greek arms vastly superior to Persian arms. And uh, in particular, it's a question of tactics. I'm going to have to use the board for this one. He's going to show us some. We brought some, you know, for show and tell. Yeah, okay. Uh, the Greeks developed a, a tactical formation that they called a phalanx, right, which the Persians didn't know how to handle. Now, if, if you're looking at a phalanx from the side, uh, let's look at it from the side. We'll, we'll draw ourselves a, a simple phalanx. There, we got ourselves a little phalanx here. All right, so we're looking at this phalanx from the side. Say we're going this way. Our enemy is over there. Uh, dude number one is going to have his shield right there. All right. And he's going to be holding a spear that comes out like that, right? Dude behind him is going to have a spear going up and going up and going up. 
Uh, and they're going to be holding shields in various places, either up here or the guys on the side might have them over here. Right? Now, what a phalanx, if you're looking at it from the side, it looks like a giant armadillo you know, with spikes coming up and things coming out the front. And, of course, if you're the enemy over here, there's only one place for you to end up, and that's right there. Right? <laughs> so the, the Persians have, have no idea how to deal with this. Uh, now, the Macedonians made some advancements to the phalanx. In particular, they decided if we make the spear longer, it'll be even more effective. The only problem, if you make it longer, then it kind of gets heavy, right? So, so you have to make it lighter. So the Macedonian phalanx would involve a longer and lighter spear. Uh, but the Macedonians also used cavalry. Right? They didn't like using chariots, though. And so you'll see Alexander will fight many of his battles against the Persians around the banks of rivers and things like that, where the Persian chariots would be at a disadvantage. Um, now, of course, in, in ancient Greece, in, at least in, in classical Greece in the 5th century BC, uh, the Greeks didn't know how to, how to besiege a walled city. That was just something that, that nobody knew how to do. Uh, but Al by the time we get to Alexander's time in, in the 4th century, in the Hellenistic period, uh, they developed siege engines, catapults that could throw flaming objects into cities. And, and uh, Alexander was a, a great engineer. He even built uh, causeways and siege towers and, and things like that if he had to. So. As a segue to the next lecture, uh, does anyone know who uh, was the teacher of Alexander the Great? Yeah, Aristotle, and that that's, uh, that prefigures a little bit of what's coming. And also, I want to give uh, I want to give credit uh, to one of the members of the audience when I was talking about materialism. She came up with a, a very catchy little reminder. She said that only matter matters. Yeah, that's kind of catchy. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That that might actually stick. I, I don't think you'll forget materialism with, with that comment there. Anyhow, thought I'd share that. Can either of you describe what it was like uh, between uh, Greek culture and the early Jews? Any interaction there or anything like that? Awesome question. Um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, the Jews are brought into contact with Greek culture directly as a result of Alexander's conquests. Right? Alexander's conquests bring Greek culture uh, to Palestine. Uh, they create great, great centers of Greek culture uh, in the Eastern world, in Palestine, Syria, and in Egypt with the, the creation of uh, the city of Alexandria. Right? And uh, so the Jews are, are brought directly into contact with Greek culture. Now, in the Hellenistic period, of course, the struggle for the Jews is actually a, a struggle against the, the influx of Greek culture. Right? We see in, in the books of Maccabees, uh, religious, for religious Jews, Greek culture is quite rightly anathema. Right? We're faithless Jews, Jews who apostatize. They start to behave like Greeks, talk and think and act like Greeks, and forget their faith. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. The, the uh, harmonization of Jewish traditions with uh, Greek ways of life and Greek thought actually cannot occur prior to the coming of Christ. It's only after the coming of Christ in the time of the fathers that we see a real harmonization of, of Judeo-Christian thought uh, with, with Greek thought. And that's, that's a very generalized answer. Uh, yes, I'm just curious, uh, when did the Latin language overtake the Greek language? Well, the, the answer is, is never, uh, to a certain extent. Uh, <laughs> here's the interesting thing. Um, Obviously, the, the Eastern Mediterranean was united by, by Greek culture, Greek language, that sort of thing. Uh, after the Mediterranean world was united politically by the Romans, Greek remained the language of culture. Greek remained the language of, of cultured men, of educated men. Uh, every educated Roman spoke Greek. The Romans held um, Greek literature and, and philosophy to be the highest form of, forms of literature and philosophy. Right? The, the Romans held their own, all the uh, Roman philosophy, Roman literature, all of these things are, are simply derivative from Greek uh, models. And so, so Greek really remains the, the principal language of cultural exchange in the Mediterranean world uh, in, in antiquity, even in the Roman period, whereas Latin was used as the language of administration for legal, political purposes, for the military. Uh, you know, any, any, anyone from anywhere in the Roman Empire who became a soldier would have to learn Latin uh, to serve in the military prior to you know, the, the time of the Federati. Uh, but in any event, yeah, it's, it, for the most part, yeah, in the Roman period, Latin is the language of the military, Latin is the language of, of politics and administration, and Greek was the language of, of cultural exchange. Uh, and I mean, even this is certainly true in Cicero's time. Uh, he talks about how every educated Roman knew Greek. Yeah. You want to elaborate? No. And of course, you know, Augustine was uh, significant because he didn't know Greek. Okay, and he began writing in Latin. And so then you have an individual like Boethius who comes after, after uh, uh, 
you know, it becomes a little bit more in vogue, obviously, to write in Latin. And then you have individuals like Boethius is one of the last cultured individuals precisely because he knows Greek and because he's able to translate, and at least he did translate the majority of the logical works of Aristotle into uh, Latin from Greek. And, and this is, of course, before uh, you know, the, the, the end of the classical civilization kind of is, is exhausted. And, and there's a period of, of, uh, of uh, disillusion in, in, in certainly Western Christendom. We'll see you back here, same time, same place next week. And, uh, and then after that, you have your Thanksgiving break, and then St. Athanasius on the Incarnation. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.